Lord, but God, we come before you recognizing your sovereignty, your power, remembering that you draw us and call us, woo <coughs> us and love us. And so we gratefully gather in this place this morning to worship you and all that you have done for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that this time of worship would be pleasing to you and that you would bless us as we come before you to worship once again this day. In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you join with me in the call to worship that's in our bulletins taken from Psalm 36 this morning. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. The crisis is in your family love, O oh God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. Only with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Continue your love to those who know you, your righteousness to the upright in heart. Let's stand to sing our first hymn of praise, number 655.
the humble creation, sinful by nature, and God just desires to bring us in, uh, to allow us to unburden ourselves, admit our sinfulness, and then move on, forgiven, and back out into the world to live again anew. Uh, every Sunday is this little bit of a rebirth that uh, we claim because of what Christ has done for us. And so uh, it is always uh, a particular honor to pray among God's people this prayer of confession that we pray each Sunday. So would you join your voices and your hearts with mine? Let's pray the prayer that's printed in your bulletins together. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions of today. According to your steadfast love, remember me, O Lord. Hear my prayer for release, and grant me your peace, for good and upright you are. You instruct sinners in the way of redemption, and light their path that they may serve you. By the gift of your redeeming sacrifice, pardon my guilt, O Lord, for you alone have the power to cleanse me from all my sin. You alone impart righteousness upon the peoples to all who humble themselves and trust in you.
going to lead us in our prayers this morning. I just have a few updates uh, on our prayer list, people who are on the list. Uh, May is still at home, um, still suffering with shingles. Um, she is accompanied by her daughters. I think both of them are there now, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, she needs our prayers. She's very, very weak, um, has no appetite. Uh, and so if you would just remember them in your prayers uh, as May is, is struggling with her, her shingles and her daughters are caring for her. Also, um, Bob Rathgeber is now in the hospital. Um, he had fluid still uh, in his lungs, and so they put him back into the hospital. Uh, Marianne, I pray, is on our live stream right now uh, in order to connect with some familiarity. Uh, she's struggling a little bit now that she's living with um, their son and daughter-in-law and grandson in Texas, which is a wonderful thing, but none of that is familiar for her. And Bob is also not now with her as he is in the hospital. And so uh, she's suffering from some depression and uh, just struggling on her own. So both, both Bob and Marianne. Uh, Barb Mosher, good news, is down to a cane in her house. She's no longer walking with a walker. We brought her those beautiful flowers in honor of Paul Olson that were in our sanctuary last Sunday. She was thrilled to receive them. Um, she looks good. She she's, sounds good. I still encourage you, if you have the time, uh, to pick up the phone and just say hello or stop by and pay her a visit. Um, Alfonso is not here this morning because he is home with bronchitis. He'll be going to the doctor, um, but we will remember him in our prayers. And just a quick update on my friend Virginia, who is suffering with breast cancer. Her treatments, she has, um, I believe, one more treatment after the current one that she just received. Uh, then she'll be taking a break, they'll be doing some tests, and she'll be heading in for surgery <coughs> at some point. But, Fortunately, her reaction to the treatments could have been far worse than, than they were, and so she's doing quite well. So thank you for keeping her in your prayers as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You can look me. Yeah, you're an elder. Okay. Right. okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. All right. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, we also have some uh, a joy to share that next Sunday we'll be receiving three new members into our congregation. Timmy, Young, and Kwan Bu. Take a bow. No. <laughs> We're happy to have you. And uh, are there others? Prayer concerns. Prayer concern. No, not other new members. No. Claire. Uh, just keep Helen and Walter in your prayers. Um, he is making progress. He is in um, a rehab center. I don't know how much longer the insurance will let him stay. The doctor is trying to get him to be able to stay longer. It's still a long road ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and I know Helen is just completely exhausted at this point in trying to yeah. spend time with him. Well, I, when Walter gets home, I need to talk to him. There's all kinds of Oakland stuff that Walter has answers to that I, I need. I need answers. I need answers. <laughs> I'll keep it busy. Uh, others? Anne Marie? Me. You, okay. Me. <laughs> Hi, Rash. Yeah. Don't want to leave me. Uh, uh, answers oh, wow. to. I still have it. I still, still working it. Uh, others? All right. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, you who hear all of our prayers and meet all of our needs, no matter how great or small, Lord, we claim you as our salvation. Lord, we come before you this morning with humble hearts and give thanks for you for leading us besides still waters and restoring our collective and individual souls and for leading us in paths of righteousness for the sake of your precious holy name. Lord, we gladly give ourselves to you and we put our lives into your most capable hands. Mold us, we pray, into vessels of honor that might truly glorify your kingdom and grant us the peace which passes all understanding. 
Lord, give us spiritual eyes to see, ears to hear, hands to lend to each other, and feet to go where you would have us go. Help us, Lord, to truly be your church in the world today. We pray for those among us who are sick and seek your comfort, for continued healing, strength, and patience for the people of Ukraine, for my son Zach, who's celebrating a birthday tomorrow, and for our grandson Charlie, whose birthday was yesterday. We thank you for their lives. We pray, Lord, for Helen and Walter Frank. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen Helen, heal Walter, allow him to come home soon. We pray for Anna Maria, uh, that this rash that's got to be irritating will soon leave her. For our friends Mike and Tom recovered from cancer. For my friend Bill and his wife Nancy suffering from medical issues. We pray for thanksgiving for healing Arlene's hand. We pray also for Barb recovering at home. We're, we're so happy for her progress. We pray for Lynn suffering from her eye issues. We pray continued prayers for baby Lincoln. And all those who are making trips this coming week for work or pleasure, including Claire and back up to Boston. For those facing illness and disease, those suffering from the coronavirus, for Alfonso suffering from bronchitis, for Virginia suffering from cancer, for Bob and Mary Ann Rathgeber, we ask, Lord, that you would bring Bob home soon and that you would wrap your arms around Mary Ann and uh, comfort her. We pray a prayer of uh, thanksgiving for the lunar celebration taking place at Morsemere Church today. May it be a time of fellowship and joy for all. For our church and its ministries, for the Center for Food Action, for Reverend Donna Crackin and the River Mission, for all the first responders of our communities, for those troubled by personal issues and struggling daily stresses in life. We pray, Lord, that you would answer all unspoken requests this morning. We pray for May. We ask that uh, May would be healed, that she would begin to eat well and gain strength. We pray for men and women around the world in service to our country. And we pray, Lord, for peace in all the troubled and war-torn areas in your world. And we pray for our leaders. We ask, Lord, that you would lead us in the, the way you have us go. We ask all this, our Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, and so we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Page 1773. 
page 1773, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 12. Beginning to read at verse 1. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest upon men's wisdom, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. But God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deeper things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. The second reading, if I can find it, yep, is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 13 through 20 found on, in your pew Bibles on page 1501. This is the Beatitudes. Page 1501, Matthew 5, verses 13 through 20. Wow. Uh, it's just after the Beatitudes. Yeah. Yes. That's all part of it. Yes. Yeah. So beginning to read at page 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on, a, on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In that same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commandments will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I correct myself. It's not the Beatitude, but it is part of the Sermon of the Mount. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so these are verses, some of which are familiar, um, particularly the verses where Jesus talks as about us being the light of the world. It's pretty easy to understand that metaphor of being a light that shines in the darkness and taking that light and putting it on a lampstand so that it can give light to everyone in the house. We shine the light of Jesus Christ into the world by living as Christ calls us to live. 
And as we do so then, the light of God's kingdom shines forth from us for all the world to see, directing others then to see it also. It is our greatest hope, is it not, as Christians, to show the world this righteousness and this glory of God that has been shown to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And we do this best by being like him. Light is an easy metaphor for us to understand. As human beings, we recognize the value and the importance of light in our lives. Each Sunday morning in Bible study, we light a candle and we proclaim that we do so as a remembrance that Jesus is the light of the world. And surely this is true. And by Christ's light shining into the world's darkness, the deep and hidden mysteries of God were revealed to us. Things that we previously could never have known on our own. Christ's light shining in the world reveals God's truth, God's love, God's mercy, God's hope. And it brings life then to all of us who believe in him. If you remember those familiar passages from the Gospel of John, it says that in Jesus was life, and that life was the light of all humankind. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. That's what our English Bibles say anyway. But the Greek word here for understood is katalaben, and it means more than just simply understanding something. The word katalaben, it means to seize or apprehend, to grasp something in a forceful manner. It's an image of a power, one power that overcomes another power. So if we look at not understanding the light in that context, it means that the darkness cannot and will never overcome the light of Jesus Christ that shines in our world. The darkness of this world can never attain it. It can never subdue it because the light of the world in Jesus Christ is the greatest power that exists in all the universe. <laughs> but there was another metaphor. Remember in the scripture that Ron read from us from the Gospel of Matthew this morning? It's another metaphor mentioned briefly that perhaps we struggle a little bit more to understand than we do understanding the light. What does it mean to be the salt of the earth? And what does Jesus mean when he cautions us that salt can lose its saltiness? Now I can tell you one thing, this is an important teaching for us to understand, and we know this because it's repeated in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. In all three Gospels of Matthew and Mark and Luke, the author recognizes that being salt is an important aspect of being a disciple. So let's unpack salt for a minute, if you will, in order to get a better grasp on what Jesus is trying to teach us here in these few lines of scripture. We begin by looking into what salt is and how it was used in the ancient world. So we begin this exploration then by going back into our Bibles and looking at salt in the Old Testament. We begin with the Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 18. In it, the Lord God is speaking to Aaron as God establishes Aaron's lineage to be the holy priesthood in service to God. Aaron and his offspring are to be in charge over the people's sacrifices. Part of this holy responsibility, then, 
It means that God gives back to them a portion of every sacrifice as a holy meal designed to nourish and sustain them. These priests, those whose sole job it is to serve the Lord by making sacrifices for God's people. And God then closes this charge to Aaron by declaring in verse 19 that this is a covenant of salt forever between the Lord and Aaron's offspring, these priests who will serve in the temple. And for it to be so, a covenant of salt, well, this tells us then that salt does not change, that it will last forever. And again, in the book of Chronicles, God then makes a covenant with Israel's kings. And he also describes this covenant with the kings of Israel as a covenant of salt forever. So first off, we know that salt is the means by which God makes covenant promises. Promises that will last forever. It's a symbol of something unchanging. Salt was also known throughout the ancient world, and it still is today, as being an excellent preservative. It tells us that God will preserve God's covenant with God's people. The symbol to us that God is truly trustworthy, that God makes a promise and keeps it, that God's promises to us are reliable. And again, in the Old Testament book of Leviticus, God makes commandments of God's people regarding their grain offerings. And this also tells us something then about salt. This command of God regarding the people's grain offerings says that every offering of grain shall be seasoned with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offerings. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Three times, God commands that the people must include salt in their offerings to God, which tells us that salt is a precious item worthy of a sacrifice to the Lord. In ancient times, salt was so valuable, in fact, that it was also used as currency. And even our English word, salary, comes from the word salt. It tells us of the valuable nature of something that we mostly take for granted in our lives today. Salt is also an essential mineral. It is composed of sodium and chloride, a metal halide compound essential to human life. Salt contains two of the three essential electrolytes needed for human function, sodium and chloride. Because when we're depleted of them, then our bodies don't function right. Sodium and chloride must be regularly replaced within our bodies in order to maintain intercellular osmosis, nerve conduction, muscle contraction, and kidney function. We've all seen those athletes out on the field whose electrolytes of sodium and chloride dropping suddenly have muscle spasms. <coughs> but salt is also a component in human blood and sweat and tears, all three of which Jesus shed on our behalf. So now with all this evidence of what salt is and why salt matters, its value to life and to health and even to faith, we have to then ask ourselves, how can salt lose its saltiness? Well, there is actually a very simple answer to that question. If it is not salty, then it is not salt. It is something else. It is an imposter. Salt that is not salty is simply counterfeit salt. It is worthless in terms of its value as actually being salt. 
is good for nothing except to be trampled upon, making it of equal value as common dirt. Salt that is not salty is no longer a true symbol of God's covenant. Salt that is not salty is no longer a proper sacrifice to God. Salt that is not salty is no longer valuable for sustaining human life. Salt that is not salty is no longer the ingredient in the blood and sweat and tears that Jesus shed on our behalf. It is simply no longer salt, plain and simple. Therefore, salt that has lost its saltiness has lost the value of being true salt because it's actually something else entirely. And if we are called by Jesus to be the salt of the earth, then to lose our saltiness makes us something other than a true disciple of Jesus. As Christ's disciples, we are called to be Christ-like, to mirror the new covenant of God in Jesus Christ, to be imitators of Christ in the world, not imposters, to be like Jesus, not counterfeit disciples. But surely there are still counterfeit disciples in our world, aren't there? Those who claim Christ who don't look or sound or act anything like him. Imposters rather than disciples. The salt that's lost its saltiness, that no longer looks or sounds or acts like Jesus. Because you see, if we are not like him, then we truly are worthless in terms of our value as disciples. Disciples who shine Christ's light into the world. Counterfeit disciples, counterfeit salt in the world today are those who claim Jesus but then use him for their own selfish gain. They are people with ulterior motives, those driven by self-righteousness and motivated by human greed. And Jesus even goes on to point out such people to us. In his own day, they are the scribes and the Pharisees, those <laughs> who are called by God to serve God to offer the temple sacrifices in honor of God and to represent the covenant to God's people. But instead, they grew corrupt. And they looked down their noses at the common folk whom Jesus called the salt of the earth. They claimed confidence in their own self righteousness, so sure they were that they were the special ones in the eyes of God, that they were closer than everybody else to God, that they lost their saltiness. So they wind up outside of this new covenant that God was making in the world with Jesus' own blood and sweat and tears. But in contrast to the scribes in the Pharisees. We find the Apostle Paul this morning, and he speaks of coming to the church in Corinth with weakness and with fear, with trembling even. He admits a lack of eloquence as he proclaims the gospel to the believers in Corinth, rather than building himself <laughs> up as being something great, some big philosopher or a scholar, Paul admits that he knows nothing in the eyes of the world. All he does know is the new covenant, Christ crucified, his blood and sweat and tears shed for us on our behalf. And knowing that, Paul then proclaims the secret wisdom that was received by Jesus Christ this light of the world, the salt of the new covenant fulfilled, the sacrifice made once and for all so that we might set aside all our own self-righteousness 
in order to proclaim God's own righteousness given to us in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the atoning sacrifice for sin, the new covenant of salt who proclaims that we are the salt of the earth. So be mindful of how salty you are and remain salty by remaining in him. The Lord Jesus Christ this morning calls us to gather around his table of grace again in order to receive this gift of nourishment that he himself provides to us for our souls to build us up for the work of his kingdom, to keep us salty disciples in him. So let's join him now. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ. This Holy Supper, which we are about to celebrate, is a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. We come in remembrance that our Lord Jesus Christ was sent of the Father into the world to assume our <laughs> flesh and blood and to fulfill for us all obedience even to the bitter and shameful death of the cross. By Christ's own death and resurrection and ascension, he established for us the new covenant, a covenant forever of grace and reconciliation that we would never be forsaken by God, but accepted by him. We come to have communion with this same Christ who has promised to be with us always, even to the end of the world. And in the breaking of the bread, he makes himself known to us as the true heavenly bread that strengthens us to life eternal. And in the cup of blessing, he comes to us as the vine in whom we must abide if we too are to bear fruit. Perhaps we even could have a bowl of salt here on the table today to sprinkle a little on his, his gifts to us to nourish us. We come, my friends, in hope that this bread and this cup are but a pledge and a foretaste of what is to truly come when Christ comes back, when his covenant is fulfilled, when sin is abolished forever and when with an unveiled face we shall behold him and made like unto him in his glory. Since Christ's death and resurrection and ascension has obtained for us the life-giving Holy Spirit that unites us all into one body, so are we to receive this supper mindful of the communion of saints. Come, my friends, for all things are now ready. The supper does not belong to us at all, but it belongs to Christ our Savior. And all who profess their love of Jesus are welcome to partake. Please join me in the prayer that is printed in the bulletins. <coughs> the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. <coughs> we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy and right it is, and our joyful duty, to give thanks to you at all times and in all places, O Lord, our Creator, almighty and everlasting God. You created the heaven with all its power <laughs> and the earth with all its plenty. You have given us life and being and preserve us by your providence. But you have shown us the fullness of your love in sending into the world your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, the eternal word made flesh for us and for our salvation, for the precious gift of this mighty Savior who has reconciled us to you. We worship and adore your glorious name. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord. 
God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Most righteous God, we remember in the supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. Together we proclaim the mystery of thee. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that this bread which we break and the cup which we bless may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Grant that being joined together in him, we may attain to the <coughs> unity of the faith and grow up in all things into Christ our Lord. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, shared a Passover meal with his disciples. And at that meal, he took the bread. And after he had given thanks to God for it, he broke it. And then he gave it to his disciples, of which you, my friend, are one. And he said to them, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread which we break is to us communion with the body of Christ. Let us eat of it together.
forth now into the world as the salt of the earth. Be salty, my friends, in the name of the Father, and of the Son,